Good morning. My name is Mary Claire McAleer and I'm Head of Research and Policy at the National Youth Council of Ireland. And I'm delighted to be chairing this webinar this morning and to welcome you to this one hour event, launching our research mapping youth arts provision in youth work settings. It's great to see so many people registered for this event this morning. We have over 160 people online. Um, and just to give you some background, this report was commissioned by MYCI and undertaken by UCC's research team, Dr. Eileen Hogan, Nora Furlong and Damien Drohan. It maps the extraordinary work of youth workers and youth arts practitioners throughout the country. And I think it really demonstrates the value and importance of youth arts to the lives of young people. So over the next hour, we'll be hearing from four speakers who will reflect on the research and how it can shape the future direction of youth arts. I would encourage you to tweet about the event using the hashtag, hashtag YouthArtsMap on Twitter. And also please do put your comments or any questions you have in the chat for the panel. And I will try to take as many of these as I can over the next hour. So we have a very interesting lineup. Uh, in a moment, we will hear from Dr. Eileen Hogan from the School of Applied Social Studies at University College Cork. Eileen will present the key research findings for the study. And then we'll be joined by two members of the research advisory group for this study, Lisa Kavna, Youth Officer with Tipperary ETB, and Shona Nivin, Head of Young People, Children and Education at the Arts Council. And they will provide us with some of their reflections on the work. Um, and then we will see a short video which showcases some of the youth arts work submitted as part of the mapping. And then Mary Cunningham, um, MYCI CEO, will respond to the research findings. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker of the morning, Dr. Eileen Hogan. Eileen is a lecturer in the School of Applied Social Studies at University College Cork. She is course director of the Masters in Youth Arts and Sports Education, which won the Grad Ireland TGA Award for Best Postgraduate Course, Arts and Humanity, in 2017. Eileen's also Deputy Director of the Postgraduate Diploma in Youth Work, and through these roles, she is involved in the professional development of youth workers and youth arts practitioners, and has strong connections with youth work organisations. She's a member of the Board of Directors at Youth Work Ireland Cork, and she's also chairperson of the Indie Cork Film and Music Film Festival, which is a volunteer-led organisation that supports youth arts as an element of its broader cultural programme. So I am delighted to, that Eileen can join us this morning uh, to provide an overview of her key research findings. Um, Eileen, over to you. Thank you, Mary Claire, for that lovely introduction. And hello, everyone. I'm glad so many of you were able to join us this morning. And it's very exciting to, to launch this research. Um, I'm just going to start off with a few thank yous. Um, so firstly, thanks to my two co-researchers, to Nora Furlong, whose passion for and knowledge of youth work and youth arts practice hugely shaped this research. And to Damien Drone, whose technical expertise and vision enabled the creation of the arts map. Thanks also to Mary Cunningham and to all at the NYCI. Um, it was a particular pleasure to work with Anne O'Gorman, who is a longtime champion of youth arts in Ireland, and I hope she's proud of what we achieved in this research. Um, to Mary Claire McAleer for her friendly support and expertise in guiding our work, and um, to Daniel, Alison, and Saoirse also at the NYCI for their support. A huge thank you, of course, to the research participants across Ireland, youth workers, youth arts practitioners, and to other stakeholders who gave their time in offering perspective on youth arts provision in youth work settings. Uh, and thanks to the organizations who submitted data for the mapping exercise, and I hope many more will be inspired to contribute also. And thanks too to the ETB youth officers who participated in a qualitative survey to get their views on youth arts provision in youth work settings in Ireland. And finally, thanks to Eleanor O'Sullivan from Youth Work Ireland Cork, who helped us to design and to test the mapping tool. So, 
Um, in this presentation, I'm going to focus more particularly on the findings of the in-depth interviews with the youth workers and youth arts practitioners and key stakeholders, as well as the responses from the survey of the ETB youth officers. You'll find in the report um, other quantitative data about young people's participation rates um, and, and where they're participating and what kinds of youth arts they're participating in. Um, but here I'm going to focus on the, the findings of the qualitative in-depth interviews and the qualitative survey. So the first fear's findings um, is in the area of policy. Um, unsurprisingly, the NYCI is recognised as a key stakeholder and a very important resource for networking and training opportunities. Um, with respect to policy, participants um, expressed a real need for a broader commitment to youth arts provision based on a statutory framework, which would finally signal what they felt should be a government intention to move beyond rhetoric and to really empower organisations to implement more meaningful and sustainable and robust practices. Um, some of the interviewees um, revealed a lack of knowledge of the wider youth arts policy context and a shyness, they think, or a reticence um, to speak about policy. Um, this will be a familiar one for practitioners, but with respect to arts policy, the perception remains both amongst youth workers and youth arts practitioners of the arts as a little elitist. Um, and as one participant put it, while policy strongly encourages and recognises the value of youth arts provision, in many cases the policy is not supported by the resources to make that vision a reality. Next, with respect to youth arts practice, um, there was really strong um, and clear recognition throughout the research that creative practice is a core element of the youth workers toolkit and youth arts provision in youth work settings is highly valued for its positive impact on young people. Um, youth workers skills and their capacity for reaching out to young people and particularly to disadvantaged young people was recognized as a really important advantage of situating youth arts in youth work settings. Um, however, despite evidence of really good quality youth arts activity in youth work settings, there is a commonly expressed lack of confidence amongst youth workers around engaging in artistic practice directly with young people. Um, and youth workers and youth arts practitioners reported limited knowledge about the extent and scope of youth arts provision nationally, but a real desire to know more. With respect to the benefits of youth arts practice for young people, um, both youth workers and youth arts practitioners um, often reference the health and the therapeutic impacts of participation in the arts. So uh, references to positive mental health, for example, well-being, self-esteem, self-confidence and resilience, all things which are really equipping young people in the contemporary context of the COVID pandemic. Um, there was some recognition um, of a broader understanding of the impact of young people engaging in youth arts that would consider arts as a tool for promoting and shaping positive social change. So attend, um, uh, attention to more kind of structural issues and young people's capacity for challenging structural inequalities. However, it would be interesting to see that developed further. Um, despite all of the acknowledged benefits of arts participation, however, youth workers and youth arts practitioners and other stakeholders felt that there is a limited commitment to youth arts provision in society and in policy making. With respect to funding, um, it will be of no surprise that funding or lack of funding was a dominant theme throughout all avenues of this research. Youth organisations are still dealing with the damaging impact of austerity cutbacks. As one participant put it, the youth work sector has suffered huge cuts in the past 12, 13 years as a result of austerity. And while there's a willingness and a recognition of the value of creativity and creative opportunities for young people, I think a narrowing of focus of targeted schemes is diminishing the capacity of organisations to fully deliver on what they would like to do, and I think what they would see value in doing. Youth workers and youth arts practitioners believe that the youth work sector is comparatively less well funded and less well recognised than the formal education system with respect to arts provision and that private arts provision dominates. And this means that there's a lack of capacity to expand youth work and youth arts provision. 
Respondents argued that the outcomes focused funding model detracts from the intrinsic value of participating in youth arts programmes and the imperative to be learning something that is measurable makes it difficult to maintain freedom in youth arts processes and practices. But in this respect, and despite this challenge, youth workers and youth arts practitioners persist. Although there's lip service about the rights of young people to choose and participate in the design of projects and activities, there is a sense that the targeted initiatives impose pre-planned activities on them. Furthermore, some respondents were cautious about a perception that youth arts and youth work can be a quick fix or a panacea for deep rooted social inequalities. And uh, they found it troubling that funding models are often based on this assumption and short term funding models in particular were seen to exacerbate this issue. With respect to human resources, uh, firstly, respondents argued that youth arts practitioners and youth workers are highly skilled, educated professionals, but this is not reflected in pay and progression opportunities. Lip service is paid regarding people's skill sets and the value of their service, and it is recognised as frontline service. But there is an evident need for people to be paid a fair wage for this work and for more secure work conditions to be provided. Secondly, the impact of austerity is still apparent in terms of staffing shortages. Thirdly, there's a perceived to be an absolute lack of recognition of the time, the knowledge, the skills involved in the administration and management of youth arts projects. Uh, a significant issue is lack of funds for the administration and management of youth arts projects that support services and organisations to apply for funding, to engage in evaluation and evidence outcomes, to develop policies, to develop practices in adherence with child protection, health and safety regulations and so on. This renders invisible the multi-dimensionality of the youth worker role and the youth arts practitioner role and the complexity of youth service provision, including the crucial need for financial support in resourcing administration and management of projects. Um, with respect to training, it's recognised that there are very uh, positive training opportunities available. However, there's a need for training of youth workers in youth art, art practice. Um, interestingly, again, despite the evidence of very high quality youth arts practice within youth work contexts, there is a lack of confidence amongst youth workers and particularly amongst volunteers about their perceived creative deficits. The lack of knowledge and understanding of how policy impacts youth arts provision implies a need for training in this area, we would see for all stakeholders. The point was made that there is an unrealistic expectation of youth workers, youth arts workers and volunteers who are very often participating in training in their own time and that this is unpaid. With respect to facilities, uh, the infrastructure that youth work provides for facilitating the participation of young people is crucial. Um, however, it's felt that this infrastructure is lacking in capacity, again, due to cuts and lack of funding in the sector and provision in rural areas is considered to be particularly poor. Um, people give accounts of groups having access to a space, for example, for a couple of hours a week, but have no storage space for equipment, for materials, artwork, props. Um, oftentimes, youth workers and youth arts practitioners spoke about working out of the boots of their cars. Um, it's very often that the arts worker who is responsible for storing and transporting materials and furthermore rising public liability insurance costs are another factor impacting on accessibility of space. With respect to collaboration, respondents felt that there was no consistency in the collaboration of stakeholders across the country, that it's piecemeal, that it is ad hoc. They felt that there was no time for developing new meaningful partnerships, even though there was very much a desire for doing so. And again, this links back to lack of resources for administration and management of projects and lack of recognition of the multidimensionality of the youth worker role and the time it takes to be a youth worker and indeed a youth arts practitioner. Some respondents felt that current funding models are encouraging competitiveness rather than collaboration and in seeing that this, this policy is going in the wrong direction. Finally, we asked 
participants to comment on their aspirations um, for youth arts provision in youth work settings in the future. And this is an area where consensus was generally met. Um, appropriate and decent facilities with universal access for all young people with an emphasis on rural youth was seen as a priority. Youth workers and youth arts practitioners need decent pay and conditions and a considerable increased investment in the management and administration of projects and organisations. And it was felt that this would provide better support for collaboration, especially in recognising the time investment and the human resource requirements. Respondents felt that, um, argued that across departmental, joined up thinking is required to facilitate collaboration between arts institutions and youth organisations and other stakeholders, and to adequately resource meaningful partnerships. A more collaborative approach at government level would assist in giving parity of esteem to both the youth work and arts sectors and would recognise the distinctive capacities and contributions of each in advancing youth arts provision across Ireland. This would also help to challenge perspectives that see the arts as elitist and youth arts as a space for working with disadvantaged or at risk young people only. It will also help to raise the status of youth arts and youth arts practitioners. So analysis of the research findings indicates the need for thoughtful planning and some important shifts in emphasis in youth work and arts policy and practice at national and local levels in order to advance meaningful and sustainable youth arts provision in Ireland. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen, for an extremely comprehensive overview of some of the key findings. Um, it's an excellent report, so I would encourage you to download this report and share it widely. Um, I would also like to ask you to put your comments and questions in the panel. Um, there's some key themes that have emerged there, and we'll be picking those up with Eileen at the panel discussion later um, in the programme. So we move now to our next speakers, and I'm delighted to introduce uh, Lisa Kavna to share her views with us um, on the research. Lisa is a youth officer with Tipperary Education and Training Board. Lisa started her career as a youth worker and moved into the role of ETB youth officer 14 years ago. Lisa holds a Bachelor of Social Science degree from UCD and she has a Master's in Social Policy from UCC um, where her research focused on state funding in Irish youth work. Lisa also holds a master's in child and family law from UCC and she's primarily focused on child law, children's rights and juvenile justice um, in her master's. Lisa is currently the chairperson of the Irish Youth Officers Association and was recently part of the Irish delegation at the third European Youth Work Convention. Lisa you're very welcome. Thank you, Mary Claire, for the um, introduction and good morning, everyone. As Eileen mentioned, it's great to have so many people join us this morning to launch this really interesting and important research. To see it published and launched today is testament to the fantastic work undertaken by the researchers, Eileen, Nora and Damien, and also to Anne, Mary Claire, Mary, Saoirse and Daniel in the National Youth Council as it clearly demonstrates their strong commitment to youth arts in youth work. As an ETB youth officer and the chairperson of the Irish Youth Officers Association, my involvement in the research was as a member of the research advisory group. As many of you know, education and training boards, or ETBs as they're more commonly known as, play an important role in youth work, as ETBs have statutory responsibility for youth work in Ireland. This was outlined in the Education and Training Boards Act of 2013 whereby ETBs were given the legislative responsibility to support the provision, the coordination, the administration and the assessment of youth work services. So in practical terms, this means that ETBs and primarily youth officers aim to coordinate the provision of youth work in their geographic area, to provide the funding to youth work organisations to run and manage youth work projects, to assess the need for new services and the augmentation of existing services, and to support quality provision of youth work through the implementation of the National Quality Standards Framework for Youth Work. Overall, youth officers and ETBs maintain a governance and oversight role over the youth work projects funded through the ETBs. 
This research was a great opportunity for ETB youth officers to review and reflect on the nature and scope of youth arts provision in youth work settings in our ETB areas. While the research identified the varying degrees of provision throughout the country, it also highlighted the fantastic work being done by youth workers and youth arts practitioners in youth work services in many areas, with well-developed partnerships between youth and arts organisations in some areas. The youth officers, as key stakeholders in youth work, were all engaged in the research through surveys and interviews, and the findings highlighted that youth officers perceive youth arts practice as highly complementary to the principles of youth work. Youth arts aligns well with the seven personal and social development outcomes in the new UBU scheme, which was launched in 2019. While this scheme is primarily a targeted scheme, targeting identified young people aged 10 to 24 for inclusion, it also provides an opportunity to offer some universal provision as part of the overall service within a community. In communities where young people may have fewer opportunities to engage in youth arts, youth work services and projects can offer a space for young people to engage in and connect with a diverse range of arts. These experiences can, en can enrich the lives of young people and can open the door to new opportunities in a manner that is accessible, in a place where young people are comfortable and with highly skilled youth workers who can facilitate young people to explore their creativity and co-create art in a meaningful way. Collectively, we must now focus on further developing and expanding the opportunities available for young people to engage in youth arts and youth work settings. We must celebrate their participation in the arts and recognize and showcase their work. I commend the youth workers and youth arts practitioners engaging with young people, offering many opportunities for young people to have fun through the facilitation of meaningful arts practice. I urge them to share their art with their local communities and with the broader youth work and arts communities through this mapping project. And finally, I look forward to seeing where this research takes us as we work together to implement the recommendations in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, and some very thoughtful reflections on the work. And we'll be picking up again some of those themes. So again, please put your questions and comments in the chat. And then now to our next speaker, I'm delighted to introduce to you uh, Shona Nivrin. Shona is Head of Young People, Children, Education at the Arts Council, and she's also a member of the Research Advisory Group for this study. Shona previously worked as an independent advisor to the Arts Council in the areas of arts in education and youth arts. She has a Master's in International Education from New York University Steinhardt School of Culture, Education and Human Development. And prior to her work for the Arts Council, she delivered arts and culture programs in New York City, public schools, first as an actor teacher uh, with the creative arts team and later as director of Global Classroom with One to World. Jen is also a member of Dublin Youth Theatre and she says that's where her passion and brawl for the youth theatre has come from. So Shona, I'm delighted you can join us uh, this morning to share your thoughts and um, the floor is yours. Thanks very much Mary Claire. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me to say a few words today. Uh, the Arts Council and the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth, um, uh, we together fund NYCI's arts programme, including the Artist and Youth Work Residency Scheme. And in 2019, additional ring fence funding went in to fund this research and mapping. And it's just really great to see the outcomes of that work now. And a huge thanks is due to the researchers and to the team at NYCI that have supported them. I think the document, which I was reading through last night, it makes for a really good read. There are a lot of interesting insights and observations gathered through both the literature re review and the interviews and survey responses from the youth officers and practitioners. And um, so I'm looking forward to unpacking those over the coming months and hearing the views of other policymakers and stakeholders. Um, the challenges that the researchers have noted with the mapping exercise are interesting too. Um, they've said, um, at one point they say, the exploratory nature of the work reinforced how necessary and timely this research is, and I think I would agree with that. Um, the map gives us a sense of the types of youth arts provision happening around the country, but that's what it is. It's a sense, it's an indication, um, and it's so important to make that work visible. Um, 
And there are also questions that the map leaves, with, leaves us with, um, which are equally important. Um, what's not on the map? Either that is happening, but is hidden and precarious, or that is not happening and should be. Is there an absence of provision for young people out of school who want to develop skills in dance, circus, visual art, film, animation, music, architecture? Um, the research also mentions, um, in, as part of the literature review, the Growing Up in Ireland research and the analysis of arts and cultural participation among children, which was published by the Arts Council and the ESRI. And um, it rightly points to some of the challenges that that research has highlighted. Uh, the findings in relation to young people up to the age of 13, showing that many arts activities outside of school have to be paid for. Um, and we've since published research that continues to look at the growing up in Ireland data for 17, 18 year olds. Um, uh, and uh, I'd really encourage you to look at those uh, publications. They're available on both the Arts Council and the ASRI websites, along with this piece of research that's being launched today. Um, the focus of this research was on youth work, and there are a set of structures around the provision of youth work that are overseen by the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth. I like saying the full title because I actually love all of the different pieces that are now in, in, in that department. Um, but youth work is also a practice and youth arts is a specialised youth work practice. Um, uh, so it, it is interesting when we think think about that. So um, NYCI has it has its definition of, of youth arts, which I think is is really helpful. Um, you know, saying and it's referenced in the re research. You know, it can be broadly defined as young people taking part voluntarily in creative, cultural, or expressive activity outside of the formal education process. Um, it can encompass participation and appreciation as well as engagement with arts works specifically created by, with, or for young people. So when we look at the practice and the principles, so you know we're talking about youth-centered. Uh, we're we're looking at the social, personal, and artistic development of young people, and the context is not for profit. Young people opting in, services are free or heavily subsidized, and um, and we realise that youth arts activity doesn't always fall neatly into one area of public service provision, and um, the various funding models are pointed to in the in the research. So there can be real richness here, um, but there's also precariousness, um, which is also highlighted by the research, that comes with a kind of hodgepodge provision. We all have a role to play, but then none of us holds all of the responsibility. And so we have the opportunity of brilliant things happening in partnership, but also the risk that sustainability and commitment will be an issue. Um, I think this precariousness has been highlighted by the, the pandemic, the current pandemic, as we struggle to draw lines around what services are essential. What is essential to a young person's development? I think we're all very aware of the big absences in young people's lives at the moment and also the incredible role that youth arts has played as a lifeline for young people, helping to keep them connected even within the limitations that come with online connections, smaller pods, distanced dancing. Um, it also prompts us to think, um, what are the absences and the gaps in provision for young people, even outside of a pandemic? As a young person growing up in any part of Ireland who wants to develop their skills and enjoyment in areas from circus to dance to spoken word, film, music, can you be guaranteed access to that kind of learning? And the truth is you might be, as there might be a world-class circus or dance project or film project in your area. We fund these, the Arts Council funds these, the Department of Children funds others, EU grants have played a huge role, but they're not all over the country and they are not a given. So there's a lot to think about in terms of where we go from here. And again, I'd like to say my thanks to the researchers for prompting us to think about these challenges with renewed energy and determination. And I just do want to um, give a, a few quick plugs because I think there's a lot of people on this on, on this webinar today and um, just around funding programs available through the Arts Council this year that might be of relevance to you and um, so because the Arts Council has a key objective to plan and provide for children and young people as part of our strategy and um, which is, is current we're in the middle of now started in 2016 and it runs to 2025 and um, and you know our strategy recognized that the, that uh, this planning and provision for children and young people is something that can only be achieved in partnership with others 
Um, so, you know, we've we've invested in new in initiatives like creative schools, which are referenced actually also in the research. And the in-school part is important too, but of course the out, out of school um, is this essential part that we're also focusing on today. Um, and we've been incre increasing our investment in arts organisations and artists, artists working with, with and for children and young people. Um, so coming up actually this year, we've just um, published our funding programme for the year of different schemes that are going to be available. Um, so we've just had a, a deadline for the YPCE Bursary Awards, which is for individual artists that work with and for young people. Um, but there will be another round in the summer as well. Um, on the, I think 24th of June is gonna be the deadline. You can check the website for that. Um, the Young Ensemble Scheme is coming up um, with a deadline of the 15th of April, where groups of young people who are collaborating on um, artistic projects of any kind um, can, can apply um, for the young, uh, support through the Young Ensemble Scheme. And there's a real emphasis on youth voice, young people's artistic voice and expression through that scheme. Um, so I'd really encourage you to have a look at that. Um, the YPCE Project Award, we were really happy to be able to introduce this uh, just in the summer of last year as part of the additional funding that the Arts Council um, uh, received from government in the context of COVID-19. Um, and actually there was an investment of a million, uh, additional million euro in um, young people, children education projects um, through, through this award. Um, and they, they span across different age groups, but about half of that actually was for the Strand 3, which is transitions. So many youth projects um, um, have come through there. So it'll be really interesting to see how those, um, how those get on this year and how those develop. Um, so there will be, um, the deadline isn't confirmed yet, but again, around July, August, um, that should open again for projects that are being planned for 2022. Um, and also, um, just to point out, there are other supports um, coming up on the 22nd of April, the Creative Places Award and Invitation to Collaboration, which really focus on local authorities, a key partner with um, for us um, in terms of um, uh, young people's participation in the arts. Um, so it's definitely worth having a look at those awards as well. And please do get in touch with us if you have any questions in terms of making an application um, around those. All of the contact details are on the Arts Council website. And just a, one final plug actually for our partners in the Department of Children uh, who are working with Feroiga on the Live Out Loud um, uh, campaign. I just really want to encourage young people who are involved in the arts and who identify as LGBTQ plus to please get in touch with their campaign to share your stories about the role the arts plays in your lives because it's a great platform to have your voice heard. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Shona, for again another very thought thoughtful and considered response to the research and um, a lot of information on funding opportunities. I think you've picked up some of very interesting and key points for us to consider. And um, we can return to some of those themes at the panel discussion because there's a lot of questions coming in uh, in relation to funding um, and many other aspects of the research. So um, we'll move now to uh, a short video um, showcasing some of the youth arts work submitted as part of this mapping project. Um, and in this piece, you will also hear uh, the voices of some of the young people who participated in the youth arts um, throughout the country and what this experience means to them. You forget about everything that's happening in your life. It just gives me an opportunity to focus and to take that time for myself. It brings people out of their shell. It gives people lifetime friends. I mean, I did it six years ago. It still stays with me to this day. It has helped me to become more confident with talking to new people. Kind of stopped caring what other people thought of me because I was kind of like, you know, I'll do, I'll do me, I'll do me. The Thai Youth Project is a place that we can go to learn and have fun.
it's a really difficult thing to read out in front of other people. It's a really, really difficult thing, and I think that's it, it got easier for everyone over time because as more people read and read, everyone got more used to it. I think it was brilliant. I loved every every single second of it. The theatre is a safe space to fail and try out different things. I did stuff in NYT that I would never do on stage or even dreamed of doing on stage or will ever probably even do it again. People who live in rural Ireland who don't get that opportunity, like without it, there's nothing else there. I think it's very beneficial because I see what working on an actual set is like and I get to experience that. It allowed us to express ourselves and our personality. My favourite part was developing my own poems and just being able to create my own poems from ideas that I had had. And I'm really, really appreciative of the Lit Festival because I made so many new friends through it and met these amazing people and saw how talented they are. And I'm just really, really grateful. You're getting to meet a lot of like-minded people from around Ireland, some from abroad, to network with and also to learn together about filmmaking. Because it's not just a one-person job, it's about collaborating with different people. So it's great for that. My favourite part of the workshops would have to be when I got the chance to write my own poems and then about different people's like writing techniques and what they like to write about. And then when you're thrown in to the whole experience, realizing how theater actually works. It's a sector that employs thousands and thousands of people in Ireland. So it's just a way of showing them a route into it and that means a way of like letting people's dreams come true, which what could be more important than that? Thank you. And uh, I think you'll agree a very powerful visual of some of the work um, featuring on the mapping. And again, thanks to young Irish filmmakers for collaborating with the NYC team on the production of the video. Um, so we'll move now to our final speaker this morning. I'm delighted to introduce Mary Cunningham, our CEO, CEO of the National Youth Council of Ireland, a post she's held since 2002. Mary is currently vice chair of the National Children and Young People's Advisory Council and a member of the North South Education and Training Standards Committee for Youth Work. She is currently on the board of Jigsaw and is the chair of their governance and HR subcommittee. Mary holds an MBA from the University of Ulster. Mary, over to you. Mary, you're mute, unmute. You could unmute. Apologies for that. Um, good morning, uh, actually it's afternoon, uh, um, everyone. Uh, and thank you very much, Mary Claire, for that, for that introduction. Um, what a very beautiful video showcasing, um, you, you know, such a wide variety of youth arts practice in, in Ireland. And I think the really powerful uh, part of that video was actually the voices of of, of the young people and some of the phrases where, you know, I'll do me and um, uh, letting uh, uh, people's dreams come true, which I think just sums up, uh, you know, the very best of, of what youth arts has has to offer to, to young people. Um, so in this launch, I came across a couple of quotes which I'd like to um, share with you. You know, a former US Secretary of Education uh, said, a society that treats the arts as the province of just a few gifted children or views the arts only as recreation and entertainment. It's a society that needs an infusion of soul. The arts are an essential element of education in its broadest sense. So just like reading, writing and arithmetic, music, dance, film, painting and theatre are all keys that unlock profound human understanding and accomplishment. And closer to home, 
uh, a former Minister for Culture in England, said that I would not be a Member of Parliament, I would not be the Minister for Culture, coming from the background that I come from, having grown up in inner city London in the 70s and 80s, were it not for youth arts. The opportunity to be involved in music and to be really enlivened by drama and working with wonderful drama people after school gave me the confidence to believe that I could be anything I wanted to be. What powerful statements about the value of youth arts. And indeed, we heard earlier that one of the speakers uh, today, Shona from the Arts Council, actually got her love from the arts through her participation uh, in youth drama. In MYCI, we believe that all young people should have the opportunity to develop their talents, their skills and their confidence so that they can be their very best selves. We want all young people to have the opportunity to feel confidently, I'll do me. We know that the arts are an important part of any functioning society reflecting the culture. In MYCI, we believe that youth arts are important. We need people to both say and see that arts and culture are as important as other things in society and in local communities. We need people to see that arts and culture are as important as, say, sport. There are people inspired by the dream of playing for Liverpool or Manchester United or Dublin, but there will be many more young people inspired by the arts, inspired by music, poetry, inspired by theatre, inspired by dance, inspired by drama, inspired by circus and the many other art forms that make up the whole arts family. And when young people are given that opportunity to participate both in creating and appreciating art, they're not only learning how to take part in the culture life of society, but are also actively involved in creating that culture and experiencing that resultant sense of belonging and empowerment. MYCI recognises that participation in the arts is a positive youth work tool and a valuable experience for young people. It is important to their individual sense of well-being. It's important to their confidence and self-esteem. It's important to how we feel about ourselves and the world, and it's important to self-expression. In MYCI, we are passionate about all of youth work embracing youth arts to further the goals of youth work and support young people's personal and social development. MYCI's belief in the value of this work and the contribution that highly skilled practitioners make to the quality of the work is reflected in our work in the National Youth Council's Youth Arts Programme since its inception in 1998. Research demonstrates the important benefits and impact of engagement in youth arts for all young people. The analysis also highlights the many challenges that the sector faces and indicates the urgent need for a shift at policy level and significant financial investment in order to advance me meaningful and sustainable youth arts provision in Ireland. As well as providing a picture of where there are gaps in provision and research, this report also outlines concrete recommendations around the resourcing and recognition of youth arts provision, which need to be implemented in order to ensure that youth arts realises its full potential and really delivers for young people. Before I formally launch, I'd like to quickly just highlight the key recommendations. So um, Eileen has given a, an, a, an overview of um, kind of the research findings and, and they result in a, a series of recommendations, um, which it will, we will be charged with, I hope, together with, um, you, you know, the hundred odd people that uh, have participated in this webinar in making sure that this doesn't just become another report on the shelf, but that we work to make sure that the recommendations are implemented. So it's recommending the resourcing and development of a comprehensive youth arts strategy, a review of youth work funding schemes to include the additional costs associated with youth arts practice, the creation of a capital investment fund to support the development and refurbishment of places and spaces for youth arts practice. Next, Saoirse, thank you. The introduction of a new funding scheme to support the development of long term Thanks. And that is a challenge, I think, in the youth work sector, where so many of the of the project funding is is, is short term. And um, so that uh, and, and that creates great frustration, I think, both for um, yeah, for youth workers, but particularly for the young people who become engaged passionately in the in those projects. So the need, need long term youth arts uh, funding to support projects. 
The expansion and adequate resourcing of funding schemes to support partnerships between youth work and arts organisations and artists to develop meaningful collaborations. And there is a real appetite, I think, for that uh, collaboration. Establishing platforms to support the networking and practice exchanges, I think both in Ireland, on the island of Ireland and further afield. Increasing investment in showcasing, increasing investment in the design and delivery of bespoke training to address those challenges around the confidence and competence um, of youth arts practitioners and youth work practitioners. Establishing a training fund to assist youth workers to participate in training um, so that they're not having to either pay for training out of their own pocket or to take the time in their own time to participate in that training. Also recommending the appointment of an additional 16 youth arts officers to be located within the ATBs to support and develop youth arts practice in their areas. Increased collaboration between youth arts pract practitioners, the youth work sector and government departments and the development of evaluation frameworks for youth arts which are broader than some of the uh, evaluation frameworks that are currently um, available to assess the uh, impact of, of, of youth work. And again, I think one of the important things is further research uh, to provide an evidence base to inform youth arts policy and, and practice. And we know that now um, decisions quite rightly are, are looking, funding decisions are looking at what is the evidence, where is the data to support that kind of investment. But you're going to have to fund the research to provide that evidence and data so that it can impact on uh, both policy and practice decisions. So before I formally launch the research report, I, I want to also just say a few formal thank yous on behalf of MYCI. Firstly, I do want to thank the funding partners. So the Arts Council and the Department of uh, Children, uh, Equality, Disability, Integration and, and Youth. Without their support, this research would not have been possible. For the researchers uh, um, authors for Dr Eileen Hogan, Nora Furlong and Damien Drohan. Uh, and for the work that was was edited by um, uh, Anne O'Gorman and Mary. For the research advisory group uh, and for Marie Claire, what? MYCI's um, Head of Research and Policy, who was chair of that advice, uh, research advisor, Gorman, who was previously MYCI's National Youth Arts Programme Manager, Sheila Deegan, the Culture and Arts Officer at Limerick City and County Council, Niall Brennan from the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth, and Stephen Byrne from the same department, for Shona Bryn from the Arts Council, and Lisa Kavanagh from um, Tipperary ETB, for Rona Dunnett, uh, Youth Theatre Ireland, and Mags Walsh, the Director of the British Council in Ireland all of whom give a uh, considerable time and experience to support the development of the research and to, to direct and guide the research project. In MYCI, um, you, you know, to our uh, colleagues here, Mary Claire McAleer and uh, Alison Fox, the programmes manager, but particularly um, to Saoirse and, and Daniel um, for, for covering on the event today and for the work involved in the production of the um, film and also for the production of the actual um, actual report. To the ETB youth officers for engaging in the interviews and, and surveys uh, and to all the projects and the youth workers for their interviews and also for sharing them. Uh, what we also now um, want to encourage is people to, if you're looking and saying we're not on the map, um, then encouraging you to make sure that you are on the map. Um, so, uh, and, and we will be circulating information around how that's best done. In formally launching the report, I want to confirm that MYCI is committed to continuing to support this process of advocacy to ensure that we make progress on the recommendations in this report. The evidence is here, our cause is just, and we want to continue to work in collaboration with the youth work sector and the youth arts sectors to build solidarity in support of youth arts in Ireland. Thank you very much and I'm delighted to launch the report. Thank you Mary, thank you for formally launching the report and for your kind words. Um, and now it comes to uh, the panel discussion where I get an opportunity to put uh, questions from you, the audience, to our panel. So I'd like to invite our four speakers to appear back on screen uh, for the panel discussion. Um, Mary, Lisa, 
Eileen and Shona. We have many, many questions. I'd just start with some really lovely comments from the audience uh, from Louise Ryan. Congratulations to all involved in this valuable research and to the speakers. Great to hear practical recommendations uh, regarding national policy funding, further support for youth heart provision. Thank you, Louise. Fantastic research and recommendations. Congratulations to all, of, all involved. Great research, appropriate recommendations that reflect experience on the ground. Um, there are many, many questions. Um, I might just start with uh, the questions uh, from Cormac. So Cormac wants to know, have there been any positive discoveries from the pandemic that can be used to enhance youth arts and youth arts, a youth work practice in the future? And um, I wonder, do the panel have a view? Because this research was, the fieldwork was conducted uh, pre-COVID and we're in a different social context now. So I wonder um, if I could put that question maybe to Eileen. Hey, thank you, Cormac. Um, yeah, we were just speaking um, yesterday and saying that the, the, the report was submitted the day before the news broke that all universities had to close back in March. So um, it's interesting to reflect now um, in light of what's happened. Um, I think what was uh, interesting when we were doing the mapping was um, we, I suppose we expected to see a greater presence of STEAM um, oriented youth arts practice, um, which we it didn't appear as in, to the extent that we expected on the map. I suspect that that might have changed in the, in the last few months. Um, and I think I would connect that too to, it, it's not that youth workers don't have the skills, it's that they have a lack of confidence in, um, in championing the skills that they have. Um, and they're quite shy about um, showing off and showcasing what they do. Um, while that's laudable, I think it's probably to the detriment of youth work practice and its vi visibility. Um, so um, I think that's what's very valuable about the mapping process is that it makes more vi visible the diversity of youth art skills that youth workers and youth arts practitioners are using. And we've seen that so much in the context of the pandemic when they've had to rethink all of their ways of reaching out with to, to young people. Um, so yeah, I suppose that's that the, the, the significant thing for me would be that, that I would expect STEAM um, and digital youth work to have expanded significantly. And again, it's not that youth, youth workers didn't have those skills, but now they're practicing them much more. Yeah, thank you, Eileen. Um, does anyone else have, want to respond to that context? Mary, would you have a view on social context? Uh, thank you, Cormac, for the question. I suppose, I mean, just two, two quick points. One, I think you've, identified the need for some further research in relation to potentially the impact of the pandemic uh, on, on uh, um, youth arts practice. But looking more generally, I think one of the positive things that the pandemic um, has shown is that it has expanded the reach of youth work. And um, so we know from some of our member organisations who previously would have said, we're not in a position to deliver a service in Donegal, we're not in a position to deliver a service in rural Cork or rural we now know because of their creativity and adaptability that they absolutely are, albeit that it's perhaps a blended um, service and, and online. So it will be interesting, I think, for the sector to reflect on how can it now use that capacity and those skills that it has learnt um, during the pandemic to expand its offer um, to uh, geographically and to communities that, that are, are more isolated. Thank you, Mary. Um, another interesting question from Martin Fitzgerald. He says, could the panelists comment on, on a point um, made by Eileen on the content of the report, which relates to um, youth arts as a way of, of helping young people to engage in social change. Um, you know, the core emphasis of youth arts and youth work seems to be about personal change as opposed to social change. Uh, and this, this is an interesting one. Um, Shona, would you like to respond? Yeah, I think that, that's, that's an interesting question because I suppose the two are so interconnected and maybe sometimes when we talk about personal response, I know that like when we talk about artistic quality, that kind of personal response is a key thing. Um, and then you see it as well in terms of learning and the curriculum and stuff and how that kind of personal engagement is key. But that personal connection doesn't happen in a vacuum. And so it's really like, I suppose you, you need for social change to happen, I suppose, in my view, that kind of personal 
engagement is key and it's not the same as an individual response you know it's like you're you you are part of the change and you are part of the social change or part of the artistic program and expression so I, I see those things as being absolutely interconnected but it's very important to to express that I suppose you know um because um yeah just just even through the question <clears throat> I think sometimes things that, that that we read as being interconnected um uh, aren't always explicitly so I suppose for everybody um so but I think yeah that's a that's a it's a really important point and you know so that's why for example um you know I mentioned the young ensemble scheme earlier like that really is about collective collaborative work about that kind of working together I think that's one of the really key features of youth arts that is really really strong and um, each each young person is connecting personally with the process but they are part of a collective and collaborative process with others Thank you, thank you. Um, and Lisa, I'm just wondering, you know, was there anything that you were particularly struck by in the research findings, anything that you weren't expecting? Sorry, I had my microphone muted. Um, yeah, it was just so much of it was so interesting. Um, but one of the things I was struck by it, but uh, I suppose I wasn't surprised by it. And Eileen alluded it to, to it earlier that the confidence that youth workers have in their own creative ability and to facilitate um, arts practice with young people, um, I, I think sometimes they don't realize how empowering they can be to facilitate arts with young people. And, you know, really what they produce, that they, it came across sometimes that they feel it isn't as high a standard as they perceive it should be. Whereas in reality, the process that has taken place over quite a long period of time is so valuable and you know young people they're so proud of what they have produced that there shouldn't be this elitist you know approach that Eileen also mentioned that it has to reach a perceived certain standard of quality it is what it is and it's been produced by the young people and that's valuable in itself but particularly the process is so important um but and I I just briefly referred to it when I was speaking earlier that youth workers should really um, believe in their own ability to facilitate really good arts practice. Um, so while I say it, uh, I was struck by it, I wasn't surprised by it. Okay, that, that's interesting. Would anyone else in the panel share that view? Or have, were there any other findings that you were surprised by? Well, I just want to read out a few more comments. Hugh says a huge congratulations uh, to say thank you for this piece of work um, as it will help to network and expand on local youth arts and various organizations at local county and national level to collaborate and see where the gaps are and how to fill them. Um, another question that's related is around the access and Shona, you touched on that issue. Um, what do you think is the main barrier inhibiting youth participation in the arts and and in youth arts provision and youth work in the youth work sector and would you have a view on how that could be addressed? Um, I might come in there just to, I mentioned earlier the research um, that we did with the ESRI um, analysing the data in the Growing Up in Ireland study and the um, most recent one that we published was around uh, participation at age 17 and you can see that decline in participation from age 9, 13, 17 and I think young people's lives become so busy and that's where it is, where um, and what is valued in school and what are the attitudes and what are seen as important and seen as the skills that you need to carry with you into your adult life. Those kind of attitudes are really important and influential, I think. And um, so people, young people need the time, but they also need to know that their participation is valued, that it's something, you know, we, we held a youth focus group um, just before launching that research to try and unpack some of the findings with young people who are participating in the arts. And, um, you know, they did talk about that challenge of just even, even their own inner voice telling them, oh, I love this, but it's not really a real career or how am I going to make a living or, um, or those that love to do it, but they, they, they are under pressure to spend more time on, on what are perceived as academic important subjects. Um, you can't even study the arts in school um, in it for quite, quite a few subjects, I suppose, um, in, in Ireland at second level. So that, that the kind of skills actually, to, if you want to work in the creative industries, if you want to develop those kind of skills, you're very dependent on 
what your engagement outside of school and um, what you can access and what what's there for you but also what time you have to give to that and um, so there are plenty of barriers but I think that kind of um, that time is, is, is a key one. Thank you thank you Mary would you like to respond in terms of barriers um, any particular barriers that you see? Um, well, I think that uh, um, uh, Shona has, has touched of the value that uh, um, you, you know, society, including um, parents and, uh, um, and and others, place on um, youth arts. So that kind of, I, I suppose, the culture in terms of is it going to lead to a career rather than the intrinsic value of it? Um, and yes, young people are time poor. There's absolutely, you, you, you know, um, no question uh, 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 about that. Um, that there are, uh, and I and I also think because I'm very struck. Um, by the fact having very small um, uh, grandchildren, every single one of whom believe that they're absolutely wonderful, and they are at singing, dancing, drawing, acting out. All, and what happens? What happens to that passion and that enthusiasm and that creativity and that confidence? You, you know, from you are four or five or six to you then become 10, 11, 12, um, you, you, you know, so I, I think there, 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 again, there's something and it's it's interesting and um, the point that Shona's making in terms of what, what ha actually happens to young people as they make those transitions at various points in their lives. And is there something that the youth sector are doing to support that transition in a way that allows them to continue, um, you, you know, with that passion and and, and commitment to, to, to the arts and youth arts? Thanks, Mary. Thanks. And um, I'd like to just put that question to Eileen as well, because it was an, an issue in, in the research around access. Um, do you have a comment? Sure. Yeah. So something that came across very clearly in the research was the invisibility of youth arts practice within youth work contexts. So um, when you hope to get a chance to read the report, there's a quite an extended discussion about that within the literature and policy review about um, the the um, the association between um, kind of youth arts and youth work practice and disadvantaged young people. So I think part of the difficulty is a, a rolling back of universal youth work provision that we've seen in the last few decades really has meant that, um, youth work practice has um, a particular image in the minds of Irish people and maybe young people, all young people don't feel that they have um, a place within youth work organisations when that is the very foundation of youth work that it is meant to reach out to all young people. So that's something that I think we need to remind ourselves of and even more policymakers of um, is the significance of uh, universal youth work provision in providing that integrative role that young people feel um, a sense of connection to each other and that there is diversity within the cohort of young users of youth work organisations. Um, so that's one part I think that is, is significant but really there is an invisibility of youth work and I suppose non-formal education more broadly when you look at, um, at reports and I think even within growing up in Ireland study that there is a tendency to look at formal arts education um, in the school system and also private provision of um, opportunities. So I really appreciate um, the, the, the NYCI for giving space to give due recognition to um, youth arts within youth work contexts. I think that's a very key point that you've made, Eileen. So thank you for that. I'm conscious of time. We've allocated 10 minutes to this piece and I know we could we could be here for another half hour. But just the final question I put to all of you um, is in relation to the next steps. And I think I'd like to ask Mary, um, you know, the research findings and policy recommendations really they provide so much scope uh, in, in terms of shaping where we go from here, the future direction of youth arts. Um, how, how do you envisage uh, NYCI's role in this process? I mean, you've outlined some of the steps in your, your earlier input, um, but where do you think we should go from here and what are the key pieces that need to be focused on? 
Well, I think, you know, there, there obviously needs to be momentum in terms of driving it forward uh, and um, uh, not wishing to expose anybody at this point. But I, I mean, I do think that the research advisory group um, potentially it, it's worth bringing that group back together again, because obviously all of the key partners are included in that. Uh, and to say, OK, what next? You, you know, how do we actually move these recommendations forward and have and look at developing a roadmap? for the implementation of, of some of the recommendations. Because I think without that, and, and it was a, you, you know, a, a shared partnership with all of the key stakeholders that actually uh, enabled the research to happen and it enabled us to launch it today. And I think it will require all of those key stakeholders coming together and saying, okay, what does this mean for us? You know, how can we, in our bit of it, make a contribution that's actually going to advance those, uh, advance those recommendations? both at a policy level, at a practice level, and at a funding level. Thank you, Mary. And just uh, before we wrap up, can I put a question to the rest of the panel, if, if they'd like to respond in terms of, of next steps? Shona, yes. Yeah, I think there, there was a question that had come in around um, local creative youth partnerships. And I suppose just to acknowledge that there is this creative youth plan that is um, also sort of in sort of midway, I think to, to run to 2022. And it really is a good moment. I think this research is really timely to kind of consider some of the, that ambition of a kind of a, a joined up approach and what each player can, can bring to for sustained provision. So I think that's something that, um, you know that all of the different partners because that 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 working group around um creative youth has brought together the department of children as well as the department of education and skills and um the arts council is represented on that group as well and um our parent department of culture so i suppose um i think i think it'll just be important to kind of really look at that sort of sustained provision some of those those questions that are up there we all have a role to play there are um you know it, it has been it's great to see some of the 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 uh the models that are out there and um, some some great work that is being funded across different departments and um, almost accidentally like it's like you know there's co-funding of the likes of uh, Youth Theatre Ireland or Young Irish Filmmakers and um, that sit very neatly within the arts and within the youth work community and um, looking at expanding the models that are there and learning from really what some really great uh, practice and I think there's good recommendations there really in looking at um, the role of ETBs um, as well as you know um, um, local authorities and just that that and um, that overall how you how you can put a a, a a sustained network of provision in place you know a service that pe that young people can rely on and then all of the wonderful projects and stuff really can come to life within that kind of more stable sort of environment so it's, it's a big ask and it'll take all of us to really kind of get our heads into it thank you thank you and and just last comments from Eileen and Lisa if you would like to comment on that uh, there are many questions some I apologize we haven't got to all of them I'm just conscious of, of time but um compliments from so many people um congratulations on producing this excellent research your panelists indicate how youth arts map compares in terms of wider European practice um just a question are there any other similar uh, any other countries with similar exa or examples of countries leading policy where we should look at. So I might just throw that last question out. Are there any other European member states that we should look towards in terms of leading policy in this area? Does anyone want to take that? Um, if I could comment, I think what came across quite clearly was the significance of the Erasmus scheme. So I'm not sure if I would identify one specific country, but I think overall EU policy has been really important in progressing um, access to youth arts um, provision. Um, that's something that really needs to be highlighted. Um, and we've seen, once, once people get a chance to look at the activity on the map, many of the projects that are represented were possible through Erasmus plus funding. Um, so I'd really encourage organizations to, to look at that as a source of funding as well as, as a source of inspiration. Yes, good, very good point. Okay, well, I would just like to um, thank the panellists this morning, um, Eileen Hogan, Mary Cunningham, Sh Shona Nibin. Um, I would like to thank Lisa Kavna and the whole team that put this production together. Um, and uh, I would just like to encourage the audience to download this report, circulate it widely. And please let us know if your project isn't captured on the map so we can include it. And um, I would 
just like to thank you, the audience, for participation today. Um, thank you and goodbye.